We're going to have our second presentation, Melissa Fritchlich. She's going to tell you a little bit about herself, and here we go. All right, so this is supposedly working. Yes, you can hear me? Okay. So I'm Melissa Fritchley. I am um, a licensed marriage and family therapist and a sex therapist and sex educator. I have a private practice in Capitola, California, over the hill, um, where I see individuals and couples. And I've taught sex therapy for about eight years now. And part of that process is having people write their sexual histories um, from birth, from their beginning moments of feeling pleasure in their body, of the things that they were taught in their family of origin, um, all the way to my clients and students who are in their 80s um, talking about what their sexuality is like for them now. So I've been able to hear a lot of stories, different than scientific information in this way. It'll be frustrating maybe for you science-minded people. Um, but I heard a lot of stories and collected a lot of information. Um, I also teach internationally, and I've had the opportunity to teach in Uganda. And this past year, I went to Kenya um, and was able to work consulting with a group of priests and nuns about Catholic issues, uh, sexual issues within the clergy that are going on. So um, I have a lot of interesting information. And one of the things that really opened up for me is this fact that sexuality is not about sexual behavior. Because these celibate clients that I'd been talking to, many of whom had been celibate since the age of, well, since forever, they never had sex. Um, and we're now in their 70s, 80s, um, would say, I've been sexual all this time. I just didn't engage in sexual behavior. And so it was really useful for me and for them to talk about what does that mean, really? And what is sexuality then? And how do you keep that vital and alive? And how do you channel it and use it in ways that feel appropriate for you? For them, that was a spiritual question, right? For other people, maybe it's not a spiritual question, but it's a question of how you utilize your energy, how you experience health in your body, how you experience vitality, which a lot of people would say is connected to sexuality and that, that sense of there, there being a, a vibrant person in the world who wants to engage with pleasure, sensation, and their body. Right. So there's good news and bad news about sexuality, um, and particularly in the scientific realm. Uh, the bad news is that there's really very little research being done on sexual pleasure at all. When I go to my conferences, what I hear again and again is, I can get grants maybe to study sexual problems, sexual diseases, but we can't get grants and funding to study just sexual functioning, sexual pleasure, and certainly not for people within this age cohort that I see in front of me right now, <laughs> right? So people are not studying what sexuality really is for people. Right. The good news of that is that sex is um, something that our body seems to maintain in us. The ability to feel pleasure one way or another is something that is maintained in us through our lifetime. And we've got multiple systems that make that happen. Sex is truly a holistic event for our body. It requires our endocrine system to be functioning. It requires our cardiovascular system to be functioning. It requires our muscular system to be working well. It requires our nervous system to be working well. And of course, as a psychotherapist, right, it involves our mind and our heart and some would say the soul if, if you're so inclined. So it's very difficult to study sexuality and to find solutions to sexuality because it's so intertwined in all these ways. Right? Um, and, it, and so it's hard to say where did a sexual issue start, where does, what is the solution to the sexual issue. And so we really need to be thinking about a holistic approach to health when we're thinking about sexuality in general, which is great because this area, we think that way, mostly. right? Um, but when I'm working with people with sexual health, particularly as people are starting to age and their body are, is starting to change, past the point when we learned about sex, and I'll talk about that in a bit, um, I'm really looking at get them getting a team of people to help them, right? I would like them to have a naturopath on board. I would like them to have a therapist on board. I would like them to talk to an MD who will answer questions about that. If someone's experiencing sexual pain or pelvic pain, I would like them to have a physical therapist on board um, who can work with that. So it really is, a an issue in which we're looking at globalized health for someone. Right? Sexuality requires us to be generally healthy, and um, sexuality doesn't behave. So 
people will all be different, especially when we look at sexual pleasure and desire. It doesn't behave. It doesn't fit those categories. So one person may have sexual desire go away when they have clinical depression, and another person feels their sexual desire increases because that's what brings them more life and more pleasure and more endorphins. We don't really know. So we have to work with the individual, and you have to listen to yourselves. So if you're looking at how to keep your sexuality vital and alive, the first and basic thing is be really curious about yourself. Right? Because there's nobody out there right now that's going to really tell you how to do that. We just don't have the information. Right? We have pieces of information that are going to be really useful for you. But what you really need to do is get to know yourself and listen to yourself and have experiences with yourself to see what's going on and see what you like, what works for you, and what's changing over time. Right? A big problem we have in our culture is that we're taught about sexuality um, based on a 20-year-old person in a brand new relationship. Right? That's how we're taught to see sexuality. That's the way we're taught to perform sexuality. Right? Um, that's the sexual information we're given, and we kind of sort of put a box on it at that point. Okay, you know, I learned about sexuality. Many of us are learning this information in junior high or somewhere about that range. And um, even in that time frame, it's, it's pretty shameful to ask sexual questions. You know, I remember in junior high, I was like, I wanted to pretend that I knew everything about sex, even though I knew nothing. And people would be telling dirty jokes, and I'm laughing along, but I don't know what they're talking about. And everybody was doing that, right? So none of us are actually getting sexual information. Right? We're getting guesses about sexual information and pieces of sexual information and full-on myths and lies about sexual information. But we're not taught that it's going to change, that we're going to have questions, that in fact sex, done right, is a beginner's game always. Right? Because the sex you had when you were 20 shouldn't be the sex you're having when you're 40, and it's not going to be the sex you're having when you're 60. It's going to be different. That doesn't mean it has to be bad, and it certainly doesn't mean it has to die or go away, right? But it means you're going to have to stay curious, creative, questioning about it so that you can find a new form of sexuality that fits you now, today, right? And especially in that midlife range, um, and especially for women in that midlife range, Things are going to be changing so rapidly for a period of time that what feels good to you one day will maybe not feel good to you two days later at all, and then a week later it's great again. Right? And so the model that we've been taught about sexuality, where you're both supposed to come together as partners and already know what to do, right? because maybe you've done some research, and maybe you read a Cosmopolitan article about like the five steps to pleasing your man or your woman or whatever, and then you find out that those things don't work, right? but we don't have any language to talk about it because we don't think we're supposed to talk about it. Where we're supposed to learn about sex, we're not sure, but it's certainly not in the moment of doing it, right? That's not supposed to happen, but that's what we need to be doing. We need to be learning about sex as we're doing it with the person that we're having it with in the body that we have at that moment at that time. And that is just not what we've been taught at all. We've been taught to look outside of ourselves for things and answers. And so sexual vitality requires a kind of vulnerability and a kind of risk factor of saying, I don't know what this is going to be like today. Right? I'm going to have to use language and words and maybe some body. My body is pretty good at communicating some things, although we clearly miss those cues. There is research about that, right? <laughs> that we miss a lot of sexual cues from our partners. But how to communicate about what's going on for you in the moment, how to communicate about what body changes have happened for you in the moment. And as we start to age, how to communicate about sexual pain specifically, right? Sex, I when clients come to me, they're coming to talk about sex. That's what my private practice is about. They know it. And one of the things I tell them first off is, this is going to be awkward, right? <laughs> it's going to be awkward. The sex is going to be awkward for a while. I'm going to ask you to try things that are awkward, right? Because awkward is actually OK. But again, we think with sex that it's supposed to be smooth and you know, just we're overcome with everything. And it just kind of happens. And 
you know, we don't have to talk or get off someone's hair or stop because we're having a cramp. But that is our reality of sex. And a lot of times when that happens for people or when that starts happening, and for a lot of people that actually starts happening, one, when they've been in a relationship that's lasted longer than five years, right? And two, when they start to age. And that's, I, I count that as like mid-35 actually, we're starting to feel those effects of our body changing um, and onward, that they realize, oh, this, this way of working isn't really working so well anymore. Right? And there are going to be times when I have to stop. Right? And there are going to be times when I have to communicate that something's changed or something's different. And, and how to do that is really important. And that's a big piece of the work I do, of course, as a couples therapist, is how to teach people how to communicate about sex in ways that are kind <laughs> right? and open. And um, hopefully we laugh about it a little bit and that it's okay. Right? But instead, what we often feel like is when sex starts to get awkward, or difficult, right, that we need to just back off from it altogether. It's not working. It's a failure. Right? We haven't been taught a model that says um, sex is sometimes going to be awkward or uncomfortable, and you can work around that. It's okay, right? um, as is intimacy <laughs> in general, by the way, <laughs> awkward and uncomfortable some of the time. Right? And we don't need to back off of that and be afraid of that. Right? And so with sexual vitality, as we go forward, it's about being able to communicate with potentially a partner, but maybe there is no partner. Maybe it's about communicating with yourself and just letting yourself find new experiences. You know, as I said, the good news is our body maintains this system for us, the pleasure system. It maintains it till the end, right? Not necessarily in the way you think. It may not maintain erections until the end. It might not maintain lubrication in the way you think until the end, right? or orgasm in the way you've experienced it before, but it does maintain the ability to feel pleasure, right? to feel touch and to respond to that, to have intimacy and risk with somebody. It maintains all of those things. I have a client who had her first orgasm at age 65, right? and she said, I thought that system had to be broken after so many years of that not happening for me, right? And so many years of fear around sex and healing around sex and all of that. And she said it was shocking to me and awe-inspiring that my body was still available for that. And it is, right? Had she had an orgasm at 20, would that orgasm at 65 been different? Yeah, probably, right? But it's still available to her, right? And that's something that we don't hear a lot of. I also have a lot of clients who are um, in the upper age ranges now who come to me and say, I talked to my medical doctor about the fact that my desire is low or that my orgasms feel different or that I'm not getting erections. And the attitude I got was kind of like, well, you've had a lot of sex, so, you know, are you really worrying about this right now? Well, yeah, people are worrying about it right now, right? And it is important. And I see a lot of people, especially in these generations that have had kids later and things like that, who are saying, I'm, we're 60 and now we finally have time to be together, <laughs> right? And now what? Our sexuality seems like this foreign land and we don't know what to do, right? And that's okay, that's a good place to start. It's a foreign land, let's figure it out. So let's get started with that. But a lot of times people need help and that's, you know, that's where I come in, right? Um, but talking to people about the fact that there will be changes, that there's things that people can do. Um, you can use padding to support your body. Different positions are going to work better, things like that. You know, ultimately, when people say, what's going to change when I get older? You know, the key piece is, well, you are going to change. Right? What you want is going to change. The meaning that you make of sex is going to change. Your motivations for having sex are going to change. Right? What sex is to you is going to change, and that's okay, right? Sexuality may be touch, it may be laying naked next to each other, and that's, that's what a full sexual experience is nowadays. Great, there's nothing wrong with that, it's still sexuality. There is often you know, a need to grieve what has changed or what has gone away. You know, it's difficult to not be able to get erections anymore. It's difficult to not be able to orgasm in the way that you remember it anymore. And 
we don't justify a grieving process for that for people, right? But it deserves to be grieved. It is sad, right? And once you've been able to grieve it, then you can say, okay, what, what can be made now? What can we create now for myself? I find that a lot of people don't know how their body works sexually. I teach a class on um, what I call sexual anatomy review for adults, but in reality, most people haven't had sexual anatomy of pleasure systems. They've had sexual reproductive anatomy. They know that they have ovaries or this or that, but they don't really know the parts of the vulva of which there are many. They don't know how the clitoris works and how it is in the body. A lot of men don't know that they can have orgasms without an erection. Right. Those are two separate systems that don't have to come together. Most often they do. That's the 20-year-old model of sex. Erection, ejaculation, and orgasm are one unit, but they're not for our body. And so even if a man can't get an erection anymore, he can still have an orgasm and pleasure. Right. He can't have intercourse in the way that he used to but he can have intercourse in other ways. He can have sex in all kinds of ways. You know, we've been trained in a sexual model that gives us an, a sort of linear model of sex. You start out with some of A, maybe you'll have some B if you're feeling a little crazy, and then there's C, right, which is in our framework, in a non-LGBT supported framework that we have when we say have sex, we think of intercourse, right? And we think that that ends when the man ejaculates or loses his orgasm. Okay. And so what I do when I talk with clients a lot who are struggling with a change in their life around maybe er erections are not as available for them, is I say, why does sex have to stop at that point? Okay. You still have hands, you still have lips, you still have skin. If the purpose of sex is to be together and be close, or to be together and feel pleasure, which, by the way, when you ask both men and women and survey them, you say, what are the two main reasons you want to have sex? That's what both men and women say. To experience closeness with another person and to experience physical pleasure. Those things do not go away for us. They don't go away. Right? They change in how we can have them. And the way we have sex changes. But those two things are available to us. And so when we talk about sexual vitality, there's lots to say, but not in 20 minutes, right, about um, the vaginal tissues changing and your hormones changing and erections changing and the cardiovascular system changing. There's lots to say there, right? Um, and that's not what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to say is don't give up on your sexual health, right? Because most people that I've found have had to go through several doctors who kind of pushed it aside or diminished it or said, sorry, that's how it is now, before they were able to find people who said, let's try some things, right? Um, those things may be bioidentical hormones for that person, maybe not, right? Those things may be Viagra for some people, maybe not, right? Um, Viagra, by the way, was way over-prescribed, and it's one of the least re, um, refilled prescriptions, in part because sex is combining all these things. So the fact that you can get an erection doesn't address the anxiety about the fact that you didn't before, the resentment residing in your relationship about what's been going on, the fear about it, the, the fact that maybe desire wasn't there in the first place, right? So sex is so complex in this way. It's always a blend of things. But that's why, again, to sort of keep searching out, keep talking about it, keep communicating, go to therapy, do journaling, have all these different ways of coming at it. There isn't one solution that you're going to find. Right? Sexual pain is a large issue, particularly for women post-menopause and during menopause time. Um, and before that, actually, sexual pain is a quite common issue um, that people don't talk about very much. Um, pain in the pelvis, pain in the vulva, pain in the vagina um, are all quite common. And I find a lot of couples who say, I've been having sex that was painful for five years and I didn't say anything because I just thought that's how it was supposed to be. Right? And five years is a minimum guess there, often longer. 
what people don't know is that a general gynecologist isn't actually that trained in helping with sexual pain. They can find a few things, but there are specialists in sexual pain that consistently, if I send my client to one of those specialists, they will find something and be able to fix something that had been going on for years, right? So they may need a prescription for something, you know, a cream, or they may need to do some stretching exercises, or they may need some release of muscles in the pelvis or things like that. That might cure the pain, but then there's still the after effect of that. Because our sexuality is so vulnerable and intrinsic in us, right, that any period of sexual struggle tends to stick with us. And so there's a need to um, process that and release it and see how to make new space for it to be different. Right? It's not as easy as we think. <laughs> right? so, um, so I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff about what sexual changes people actually experience because I think we can, you know, we know about a lot of those. We also can speculate, of course, about the huge sexual issue of the sexual image of ourselves. Right. As we age, um, we don't look quite the way we think we look, <laughs> right? And we have those moments of looking in the mirror and being like, whoa, when did that happen, right? Um, and our partner as well, when did that happen? Wow, my husband has gray hair now. When did that happen? I don't know. Um, and so the need to really stay vital in the way that we experience ourselves, right? to allow for changes in what we picture as sexual in the first place is there, and we're not getting a lot of cultural support for that, so we kind of got to do it on our own, right, to re-envision a sexual person who looks different than the airbrushed 20-year-old, um, and to re-envision our partners as well, right? So that level of desire is really important to rebuild and to experiment with. Um, and also to know that we can pull back those old memories. You know, um, one of the things I talked about with people who are celibate, right, is that sexual fantasy impacts our body. Sexual fantasy, especially if we have touch, and it doesn't even have to be touched to your genitals, right, but touching yourself, massaging, things like that, is very good for our system, right? And so you can have sexual fantasy that draws on an old you, a you that never happened, right? Any of those things, and it's a really sweet thing, and a lot of people don't allow them to, themselves to have that, right? That that remembering, sexual remembering or sexual fantasizing somehow doesn't have a place in sexuality with a partner or sexuality in real life. Um, and so to let yourselves have that sense of that it's okay to fantasize, to think about how sex was or how it never was and could have been um, can be useful and it's helpful for you um, and it's part of keeping sexuality alive as well. As is just searching out physical pleasure, right? One of the ways to keep sexuality alive is to just build physical pleasure into your daily life. Figure out what senses really work for you and notice them. Right? A primary reason a lot of times our sexuality dies is because we stop paying attention to our physical state to sensation, right? In part, as we get older, because our physical sensation is sometimes uncomfortable, right? As the body gets more uncomfortable, it's less pleasant to want to be in sensation, to be paying attention to what it feels like in your shoulders right now, and all the stuff that I teach my therapy students, right? Feel your shoulders, you know, that stuff. But the truth is, we want to be building physical pleasures of all kind. We want to keep our taste alive our sense of taste. We want to keep our sense of touch alive with hot showers, what it feels like to have water on you, what it feels like to have the sun on your skin. All of those things are building sexuality as well. It's not about always genitals. It's not about always another person. Sexuality is fed and defined by physical pleasures, being embodied the fact that we're in bodies and they have that capability. So that's a way to keep it alive. Right? We also, of course, want to be taking care of all those other systems, our endocrine system, dealing with hormones, talking to doctors, seeing what's going on. Cardiovascular is key. Right? Sex is a very cardiovascular event. <laughs> so we want to be exercising and stretching, 
if you want your body to be flexible and healthy and able to have comfortable sexuality. Um, but, and drug and alcohol intake, of course, is key. And talking to your doctors about your prescription meds, which of course all have sexual side effects. So those are some of the nitty gritty that we can throw in that if I had a longer time, we could talk more about. But um, there are things that you can do with all of these things, right? And what we're often encouraged to do is just give up on sex. And this is a new adventure that we're on. I mean, we're coming into some of the first generations that truly expected to be both vital and sexual in their 60s and 70s and 80s, right? That just wasn't an expectation before. It wasn't supported, in fact, before. We're gonna have to fight for it to be supported now. If we wanna get into talking about sex in nursing homes and privacy issues and all of that, that's a whole nother discussion, right? <laughs> about the right to be sexual as an elderly person, right? Um, but this, this reclaiming it is a brave new world, right? So um, I encourage you to be curious about it be an advocate about it, right? Be excited about it. Um, it's gonna be different than it ever was, right? Our expectations and hopes around sexuality and partnership and vitality in general is so different than it's ever been that we're gonna have to figure it out as a culture. And you're definitely gonna have to figure it out as an individual. But don't give up and stay curious and keep exploring. And that's about my time today, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Do we have questions? I have a question. Okay. Uh oh. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Here we go. On the Cielos commercial that we watch, there are two freaking <laughs> bathtubs. What yeah. are the bathtubs meaning? Well, I think it's implying that there's naked people available and that is sexy. Really? Yeah. There are different bathtubs, but... I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to be in the bathtub with the partner. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my question to you is, should we stay sexually active to help our oxytocin? Is that what it... Um, oxytocin is, is a key player, and it's good for you. You get oxytocin actually in lots of other ways, too, so I can't claim that sex is the only way or, or necessarily even the best way, although it is a great way. Um, but you should stay sexually active for your tissues, actually. Um, vaginal tissue in particular needs to have stimulation to get blood flow to stay healthy. It's really good for it. Um, and staying sexual also keeps those patterns in our brain. So the more you orgasm, the more easier it is to orgasm next time. Right, and what I hear from you know couples a lot is like, if you don't have sex for a while, it gets awkward and uncomfortable, and all of a sudden you're like, mm, that's weird. So, yes, stay sexual for all those reasons, and it, it's physically healthy for you. I didn't have time to get into the health benefits. Isn't of it? Sex, uh, but. Isn't it uh, primary that you eat well and uh, and stay away from barbiturates and all these <laughs> kind of things? To uh, well, Jim Morrison would say no, but. Um, <laughs> But yes, he I mean. He did at 28, so that didn't work out very well. <laughs> yes, but all, all of that impacts our sexuality, and it impacts it more and more as we get older, right? The things you can get away with in your 20s and still have high sexual functioning um, and high sexual pleasure don't work so well. So yes, eating well, taking care of your heart, exercising. When the lights are out, can't you fantasize about? Anyone. Anyone. But you might not want to talk about that with your partner. <laughs> <laughs> we do talk about that in couples therapy, but. <laughs> yeah, I, told, I told Melissa at, uh, at supper one of the things, I was reading about Lana Turner, and she had seven husbands. And so when I watch these old movies, I go on the Wikipedia and I read about all these people, right? Because it's very fascinating. And one of the things that caught my attention about Lana Turner, if you know who she was, she was the, you know, the starlet and every guy wanted to go to bed with her. She said the physical part of it was not really too hot for her. She liked the romance. So she much preferred the romance. And I think most men don't get it. They don't know what romance is. That's my opinion. Tom will be lecturing next month. Your talk sounds like the brain is also a sexual organ. Yeah. Uh, do you experiment with hypnosis at all? 
I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, um, so I do, although I have to say most of the things people want me to use hypnotherapy for would be unethical. Um, like, can you make my wife want to have sex with me every day? Things like that, which I'm not going to do. Um, but I use hypnotherapy. Um, I work in, with trauma a lot as well, which is the whole other side of sexuality, right? I work with sexual trauma. Um, so I use it a lot with trauma, definitely, and with performance anxiety and things like that. It can be really effective. Yeah. I, I saw a cute joke in the New Yorker. It was an old issue. There's a man and a woman lying in bed on their backs, and the woman's kind of pouting, and the guy is Einstein, and he says, you know, the, the famous for his theory of relativity, he says, well, it was too fast for you. <laughs> right, but just right for me, right? <laughs> yes. So, so a couple are fighting, and it's about sex, and their next-door neighbor is Neil Armstrong, and she says, I'll have sex with you, when the kid next door walks on the moon. <laughs> Great audience. <laughs> Tough. Yeah, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but uh, for a woman to use a testosterone, is there um, danger with it that it creates atherosclerosis? Um, I don't know about that, and I'm not an MD, but what I do know about the studies with using testosterone supplementation for desire with women is it's not been very effective. So um, while testosterone does increase sort of that assertive wanting to have sex, um, the studies around testosterone supplementation for women have not shown that to work. Now again, desire is so tricky, right? And so to just assume that Sexual, lack of sexual desire is a hormonal issue is part of the scientific struggle there, right? Um, so I don't know if it's dangerous, but it hasn't been shown to be that helpful. So. You know, uh, John Gray was here, and he said that, that, that coconut oil for women was a real good deal. <laughs> <laughs> Oils and lubrications are always good, always good. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, with hormones, there's a range, a safe range for all hormones, and women need testosterone just as much as men, mm -hmm. but we just need a fraction of yeah. what men need. And if we lose half of ours, which we do by about 50, between 50 and 60, we, most women lose half. Mm -hmm. We can't get by on half. We only have a tiny bit. If a man loses half, he's still at, say, 700. Mm -hmm. We're at five. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right? Yeah. But you have to look at hormones as the whole spectrum. And right. the one that is missing, nobody hardly is testing for, is growth hormone. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed yeah. to crash by the time you're 70. Mm -hmm. And everything, <laughs> everything is dependent on, that, on the pituitary yeah. regulating all the other hormones. Yeah, and that's and why I work with naturopaths. And it's not, part, <laughs> it's not part of standard of care, which really pisses me off. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a, a medical need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, if a woman wants to increase uh, her libido, I, I think testosterone does do it. But the, a very easy way to do it is to use DHEA, because DHEA is metabolized slightly differently by women. I have heard things about DHEA. Yeah, yeah and it, you don't need a prescription. Things. You don't need a big hassle mm -hmm. about getting testosterone. And um, the, only, the only problem is I, I knew one woman at Smart Life Forum who was uh, doing some things to increase her testosterone, and she said the trouble was that she un now understood what it was like to be a man, and that she felt it might make her too promiscuous. Uh, <laughs> yes, I work with transsexual clients as well, and so I've, I've talked a lot about their experience of massive doses of hormone change. So there's some speculation about that you can learn from there, but it's different for everyone, and that's the issue as well, is what's a normal level for somebody is going to vary greatly. So an impact of giving a particular amount of hormone to one person is going to be different with the person next to them and the person next to them. So there's a lot to still know. Shouldn't it be fun as opposed to some kind of a chore, uh, a chore that you're kind of like you go to Fred Astaire's studio to learn how to dance and you're trying to <laughs> yeah. buy the numbers and it really doesn't function very well? Yeah, I mean, I would say that sometimes it is 
awkward and a chore, and that that's okay, but hopefully most of the time it's going to be fun. You can always work it out. <laughs> yeah. What else we got? I can dance with the best. Anything else? Thank you very much. All right, thank you all. Lecture. I have um, information if you want to contact me on the table. And I have a book coming out in November. So it's called The Conscious Sexual Self Workbook. Helps you look at your own sexuality. So. Yeah. <laughs>